Dear Professor Wadman, uh, dear colleagues uh, who are with us uh, today at the venue of the Institute of European Studies and colleagues who are uh, with us via Zoom, I'm more than glad and privileged that I can present you uh, Professor Wadman as our guest uh, for these couple of days. He came uh, yesterday into Belgrade and as he told me, this is the first time not only in Serbia but in former Yugoslavia as well. And he will be with us uh, uh, for uh, these two days. Actually, uh, we just had a very interesting uh, meeting with uh, colleagues in the Museum of Genocide, actually, uh, with some very interesting exchange. Also met some colleagues from the History Institute as well. And to, we, we have the lecture. Um, uh, tomorrow, we will be in Novi Sad, just to announce that you will be able also to follow uh, why I think uh, uh, YouTube uh, direct streaming through uh, Matica Srpska. Professor Wilding will have a tomorrow lecture at 2 p.m. Uh, in Matica Srpska. Before that, we will be visiting uh, uh, archive of uh, uh, Vojvodina, uh, where there are also colleagues dealing with interesting stuff. And one of the colleagues that Professor wanted to meet uh, is a colleague uh, Nevena Bajalica, uh, who is working also on, let me say, more or less similar stuff like the victims and so on. And so on, and so it will be a very uh, uh, intensive uh, uh, visit to Serbia. He's leaving on Thursday, I think, and uh, but I'm really happy that he could join us after COVID uh, times and uh, uh, to use his presence here to give us really some of his uh, uh, extraordinary, very interesting research that is connected with uh, very different issues, uh, not only those that he will be speaking to today and tomorrow, uh, but also some of the, let me say, again, very uh, 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 contemporary and current stuff that are uh, introducing a lot of debates like return of the mandatory vaccination and so on. But we spoke just a little bit before, Professor Wadling insists that he is historian and that he wants to see those things as they were within the original context. You could uh, uh, get from his basic announcement actually that we, we saw that he is working at the Brooks University in Oxford uh, but his whole CV is more than uh, how should I say uh, 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 fantastic in, in many ways uh, he was uh, cooperating and still working with Max Planck's Institute and many of the institutions that are really involved and enrolled in uh, researches that are connected with the victims of the Holocaust victims of the Nazi experiments but uh, uh, the, the most important things are actually the books uh, that he wrote or edited. And before I gave him the floor, I will definitely have to mention at least some of them. Uh, one uh, uh, is uh, 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 the book that he edited with uh, Mario Sturda. Uh, it's called Blood and Homeland, Eugenics and Racial Nationalism in Central and Southeast Europe from 1900 up to 1940. It's published uh, in 2007 by Central European University. It's a huge book of almost 500 pages. Uh, and there is also a chapter dealing with those issues in Yugoslavia as well. Then there is a monograph that he published in 2015 by Bloomsbury. Uh, this is Victims and Survivors of Nazi Human Experiments, Science and Suffering. And it's 300 pages, very interesting material. Uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, us as well. Then the monograph called the Nazi Medicine and the Nuremberg Trials from Medical War Crimes to Informer Consent, uh, published in 2004 by Paul Grave, and actually very interesting, I think, uh, for uh, new debates about how did we came to inform consent as uh, some kind of uh, 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 basic condition for medicine, and how for us today, we are slowly giving it up in at least specific and certain areas. Then there is a monograph called uh, Health, Race, and German Poli 
politics between national unification and Nazis. It's covered the, the time from 1870 up to 1945, uh, published by Cambridge uh, University Press uh, in 1993. Then another monograph called Epidemics and Genocide in Eastern Europe, uh, published by Oxford University Press, uh, covering the, the space from 1890 up to 1945. Uh, and as you see, that he is mostly reducing his researches up to, let me say, a new area, because after that, we, we, we came to some totally different practices uh, that lasted at least for half a century. Uh, then there is an a, a, a edition uh, that he edited. It's called From Science to Concentration Camp, Nazi Medical and Racial uh, Researches uh, from 33 up to 45, published by Rutledge in 2017. Uh, and finally, uh, the book that is very interesting, uh, uh, published last year, edited with the colleagues uh, uh, Trubeta and Promitzer, uh, and it's called Medicalizing Borders, Containment Quarantine uh, uh, in Europe since 1800. So it's very interesting. It's by started, let me say, my, my, it's published by Manchester University Press in 2021. And it is very interesting to get the, the experience of the different kind of containments and the way borders were treated actually from within the last uh, 200 years uh, uh, within different uh, um, areas and within different issues uh, where the quarantine was used. For us, for example, it's very interesting the chapter that is covering the practice of quarantine in also Hungary because we can see that in, in many of the, like Vukaradis, the famous TV show, when our people are crossing to uh, uh, Austria Hungary at that time, they were ha had to be uh, subjected to some kind of procedure, medical treatment, and to spend some time within those uh, premises. Anyway, uh, I could really spoke quite a lot, speak quite a lot about many of the different areas, and especially it's important for us that Professor, I should mention, is working in teaching on the history of medicine and as you can see from very different perspectives then we would we usually listen about the history of medicine in our faculties and so on anyway i will stop here professor Malin, thank you very much for being with us and please the floor is yours so thank you very much um professor Djokovic, for the very kind introduction and for and for the invitation for me it's very special to come here i think it's very interesting to see how the history of national socialism of its victims are seen from a serbian perspective so i'm grateful for meeting colleagues um and what i hope is is that this small Vignette, this fairly specialized in depth sort of presentation that I'll give, maybe will resonate to certain themes which 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 interest you. Um, so let me talk about the context and the methodology. Um, what I've been doing is trying to provide an evidence-based um, analysis of Nazi medical experiments. We know, everybody knows that the Nazis conducted horrific experiments, but what isn't known is who were victims, how many survived, um, and um, you can take a simple case of uh, Mengele's actual victims, twins, how many twins there were. The, the actual, uh, what's actually written is, so, often invented actually um, but I want to find docu a documentary basis um, what I can show here is an overall structure um, because um, just looking at um, either victims who were drawn into the medical experiments or new medical experiments and this is what this table shows it's the same pattern that we see from 1933 to 1940 to 1940 relatively low um, 
if you want to look for con experiments in concentration camps like Sachsenhausen or Dachau, relatively few. And then in the context of war, in the context of Nazi, the expansion of Nazi rule, um, there is a real intensification. And this intensification goes on right to the end of the war. Researchers saw an opportunity um, for their post-war careers, even though the war may be lost, they would still initiate new experiments and they would have a, a last stab. I think, for example, Mengele is a very good example. We know from the point of time that uh, Majdanek is liberated, um, he then devotes himself full time to research, to uh, improvising a twin block in Auschwitz and um, um, <laughs> devoting himself primarily to his research agenda, although he still continued on the ramp doing the genocidal selections at the same time. But the so this is. What I try and do is like a mosaic of life histories. Um, so that's the methodology. And if we look in size at different groups, we see something I think which is extremely interesting. Not only are there small groups of say, um, British, Danish, Luxembourgian, but also a very, very large group. And the biggest group is Polish. But the second group, in terms of size, is Yugoslav. And I think this should be what's going on. It needs greater attention because this is on the basis of claims for compensation after the war. So we need to see who was actually experienced, a German doctor researching, and who experienced other forms of abuse, violence, um, and um, injury in, in Nazi concentration camps. But that's the overall state of play, as you can see today. So it's a, a very, very large victim population, many different nationalities, but with this large number of Yugoslav, at least Yugoslav claimants for brutality, and there's no reason to doubt the brutalities. That is absolutely clear that uh, persons were sub subjected to. Um, and we can see in, whoops, I need to go back, in Nazi concentration camps. Um, I don't know, can you, yeah, you can, um, I have the, um, it's not surprising that Auschwitz-Birkenau is the largest focus of Nazi medical research. This happened very quickly, the uh, upscaling of medical research in, in Auschwitz. After all, the first Slovak Jews only came in um, 1942 there. So it's a, a short, very intensive history. And other well-known camps like Dachau, Mauthaus, and Buchenwald are also major centers of medical research, but each, uh, I can't say it, um, each instance of medical research is, um, it's, very it's, it's, it's very individual, and there's also a certain logic from the SS point of view. For example, in Ravensbrück, the women prisoners were showed increasing resistance, and there was also solidarity between prisoners um, in terms of the conduct of surgical experiments in the camps, so that increasingly the, uh, the, the, um, the SS felt you need to have closed off experimental blocks, for example. So the, it's um, from that point of view that there's a, seg there's a process of segregation. And we also see that in some experiments, in some camps, 
uh, Frosten Boer Gross Rolls and Maidana and Bergen Belsen, very low, low numbers. There are some claimants. It's difficult to, to assess these, but um, um, it's, um, how can I say, a very uneven history. It's a very specific history. So the methodology is to take each victim's life history, what they experienced, trace them through to the point of death or through the post-war period when they made claims, and then look at specimens and see what the surviving specimens. This is um, the top specimen is um, brain slides from the, which was actually found in the Max Planck archives. Um, and uh, the question is, were they victims of killing? And then the extent that the killings of psychiatric patients were used for research. It's an unknown, it's a, an unknown topic. There's a great deal of historical writings on the killings of psychiatric patients, but how many were used for research? How many were, from whom were the brains retained and then kept in institutes? And still today, can still find them in the collections of major institutes like the Max Planck Institute for Psychiatry or the, I found some brains of Polish victims in the um, Edinger Institute, a neurological institute in, in, in Frankfurt and mine. So that, um, and below are two um, files of stomach contents, which were in a forensic medicine collection at the University of Strasbourg. Um, the poor victim Menachem Tuchel, um, he, he was transported from Auschwitz, he was gassed, his body ends up in the uh, anatomical institute in Strasbourg where there was a new Reich University um, uh, founded and those are potato peelings from his stomach. Um, the local rabbi was not so happy about the potato peelings. There was some skin of his. Um, and they were preserved not for, because they were useful for research. They were preserved as evidence of the uh, forensic medical investigation of the, of the criminality. Um, but still there was pressure on the rabbi to, to take these um, um, potato peelings. Um, I think they would have been better in the um, Natzweiler, um, the, the concentration camp of Natzweiler in its, in it, in its museum. But um, um, that triggered a major uh, university um, commission, which was just reported actually. Um, so one needs to look at these uh, medical experiments through the lens of post-war compensation. So in July 1951, Chancellor Adenauer makes a decision that victims of medical experiments should be compensated. But it's assumed that most, most victims were killed. Um, in fact, it's a reverse situation. Another assumption that's made is that these were pseudo-medical, that these were in some ways crazy, Nazi, ideological, racial, um, racial schemes. Um, but we know that the vaccine research, they had scientific rationales. They were inhumane, they were murderous, but they was but they had a I can say a scientific logic to them. The um, the victim Menachem Tafel for the Jew, so-called Jewish skeleton collection, yeah I'd say that is certainly pseudo-medical well describes um, what's going what's going on there, but most experiments had a scientific had scientific rationales. But I can further say, having heard a lot of description, having heard some descriptions of brutality in um, in camps in Croatia, is there are no experiments in Yugoslav territory, as far as I know. I would be very surprised. I would always be open to hearing an example, but so far everything that I've heard is ex 
Yeah, as I say, um, unbelievable brutality um, and cruelty, but not experimental. Then there are forced laborers um, sent from Serbia to the North Cape in Norway. Um, they claim compensation as well for things like freezing experiments, injections. But again, I would say it is difficult to see these victims as suffering an experiment. They write the claim for whatever compensation is available, but it doesn't seem to me a, uh, I can say, a deliberately organized medical experiment in also in their case. Um, and we also have the problem of the, I would say, a further mistreatment of victims in the compensation procedures. And this lasts until a more generous regime of Billy Brandt's Ostpolitik from, 1960, from 1969. But certainly what victims write in terms of testimony of what happened to them, um, I, I mean, I think the victim's voice is very important to listen to it. Yes, there are reasons sometimes which the victim's voice maybe gets distorted because of the availability of compensation, but still, we um, um, there are a large number of Yugoslav claimants. So there is a clash over adjudication. I don't actually think the Yugoslavs actually negotiated that well. Um, the Hungarians were extremely smart in the um, thing because they, they brought the Red Cross in to adjudicate. And the Red Cross, the International Committee of the Red Cross, was gave much more generous amounts of compensation, as I'll show you. There's also the problem. There's also the difficulty of, um, uh, I could say, interrupted um, diplomatic negotiations with the Germans. So it's a, a halting process. Uh, let me give you one example, though, of um, some experiments which the um, Yugoslavs were very much victims of. These are malaria experiments of a certain Professor Klaus Schilling. Um, he was supported. He wasn't a Nazi Party member, but his malaria experiments were supported um, by Heinrich Himmler, certainly. And there are publications, and he wanted... Um, to um, how could they, to induce immunity to malaria in some way. That was the aim. And he had an assistant called Eugen Ost, who was a Luxembourgian. And Eugen Ost, when he was told to burn the documents of the experiments, kept back a large number of these of the of the actual documents from the time. So. Here we have documents on 89 Yugoslav victims. Um, some of them have the actual malaria cards, which I'll show you. Um, Croats and Croats and Slovenes, I think, predominate. But there is certainly a one Serb priest, uh, Stojanovic, who was an Orthodox priest from a village near Belgrade, Barrage. Um, and I think it fits a pattern because there were many Polish Catholic priests who were also used for the same experiment. Um, so I think the, oh yeah, a priest, good. <laughs> Send him to the experiment block. Um, was, I think, the camp administration attitude. This is one of these malaria cards. Um, what There are some where you see that the prisoner died. I don't actually find any of the um, this for the Yugoslavs, but um, this is they are very informative because what you show is the name, the prisoner number, um, which is useful because names are presented in a variety of different ways. 
Um, and then uh, more or less what the prisoner was injected with to infect him. Um, and um, the, the malaria sporozites, the type, the typology. And you can see connections between prisoners when the blood of one prisoner is injected into another. And you see different um, different forms of treatment. And there are some highly toxic drugs, uh, pyramidon, which actually caused a significant number of deaths. Um, another source for these claims are the um, United Nations archives in Geneva. Um, very early on, you see these um, how the government um, sends a short report on the prisoner. Um, so it says during the war, Peter Galyanich was, um, and they here they give the identity. Um, his um, nationality, his ethnicity, his um, experience in Dachau. And um, the issue is he, is he suffers from recurring malaria fits. And this was the argument with the Germans, because the Germans said after 10 years, malaria does not recur. And the victim, time and time again, give a sense of not only is malaria recurring, but also they've got heart problems and a lot of medical difficulties, um, which you can see some then actually, um, some die shortly after, um, so that there is a continuing there's a long-term weakness. These is some you can survive a medical experiment, but you still have to live with the consequences of it. Um, and one sees this very well. So it's a, another victim we can see. Um, you can see from the again from the card um, is the place in the sequence of research. Um, most of the research on the Croats, um, some of them begin only in 1945, so it's a late phase of the experiments. Um, uh, here we have uh, another person. I can link that to the eventual compensation that was received um, and the difficulties of um, rejection and the German arguments for the non-recurrence of, of, of malaria. Um, sorry. So again, the description is, I think, um, always interesting. Um, you can, because of the richness of this documentation, it would there would be scope for a comprehensive reconstruction of the experiment. So, blood is injected into whom, and the different phases of of, of research, um, and you can identify often the which prisoner is, and then again the position after the war that they have. Um, So we know that um, some of them, again, through the compensation amounts, and always these amounts, 2,000 marks, are really low in terms of these are single compensation, these are, these are single lump sum compensation. If you compare what a Hungarian prisoner would be re receiving, it would, would be between 30 and 50,000 marks. So much, much higher. So, um, yeah, you could say that the Yugoslav authorities were well organized in terms of collecting these, these, these victim compensation amounts. But 2,000 marks in 1959 is absolutely rock bottom compensation. So the Germans were, in a way, buying legitimacy very, very cheaply. Um, here we see a different sort of victim. Um, much more problematic in terms of the, um, um, I can say, what's going on with, the, with, with um, some form of electric currents through the, through the body. It's not 
totally impossible. There were certain um, um, electroshock treatments, for example, regard, which were experimented on in Auschwitz. Um, but the context is an unfamiliar context, uh, so outside a concentration camp. So it's it's definitely um, one would have to see if there are other claimants. Um, or again, uh, another one of these um, victim accounts. Um, here, an experiment in Ravensbrück near, in Ravensbrück. Um, yeah, there were experiments um, certainly on chemical injections of chemicals to um, um, at the end of, towards the end of the war from January 1945. Um, so that um, it, it, again, this is one that was, I can say, a compensation claim that was made and uh, rejected. So we can see there are more chemical uh, chemical experiment victims. Uh, block 10 in Auschwitz, where there was a um, Karl Klauberg, a noted um, German gynecologist and um, hormone researcher, was um, ex um, had had this special block in Auschwitz for some chemical form of intrauterine injections. Um, these were often very painful, and they left long-term effects. They did actually um, seal the. Um, seal the internal organs um, and um, did cause irreversible sterilization. So we have um, one victim from Novi Sad, um, Mirjana Kovac Mautner, uh, a Jewish victim who was deported. And um, yeah, all the victims of chemical sterilization, they have to be Jewish if they're claim if they're claimants from Auschwitz. I have non-Jewish claimants of Polish often and uh, it's impossible they would um, it may have been in Auschwitz but they were they couldn't have been victims there and we have one we have another victim of chemical injections in Ravensbrück uh, same methods rightly compensated actually she gets rather more compensation four thousand but it's still a very very low compensation Minimal. Um, two sets of twins from Auschwitz, uh, one from Maribor and um, another pair born in Iloc. I think both sets in this case survive. That often is the case with the Auschwitz, with the Auschwitz twins. Um, maybe they did not all survive the death march. Um, but um, so we can see that again uh, a Jewish specificity, and they are part of a bigger grouping. Um, rejected claims are always rejected for injections, but the Germans don't list, don't look at the evidence properly because you could be injected with the drugs that they were experimenting on that they you turned you slightly yellow and the victim says that my, my skin has this yellowish tone to it yeah it's an atibrin injection and there were experiments on that so you get cases which were wrongly rejected definitely um so what ha what is happening in terms of these um, um, com of the compensation procedures? Um, by 1959, Yugoslavia has accepted 1.8 million marks. But then they find the Hungarians and Poles get 10 times as much. So it was poor, poorly negotiated. <laughs> Certainly, and the Germans and po the um, the uh, Poles and the Hungarians could give far larger comp amounts of compensation. Um, 
One alternative, which sometimes does get award, uh, uh, awarded, is what's called the Bundesentschädigungsgesetz, a federal German system of pensions which would apply for um, imprisonment in a concentration camp, for example. You would actually do rather better than from the single lump sum compensation. So in the case of Vera Polacek, she was rejected for a freezing experiment in Auschwitz. I that there was there was a freezing experiment in Auschwitz, so that um let's uh, on, on dry cold. Um she was rejected, but maybe she did better with this alternative system of compensation. There are. Um, I am. I've just had the good fortune to meet Vladimir Petrovich, who uh, extracted four thousand one hundred and twelve victim files from the Belgrade archives of former Yugoslavia. A great deal of work that he did, and which I've been able to draw on for for this research. And then there is, from the point of view of the history of compensation, the Stiftung Erinnerung, Verantwortung und Zukunft, the foundation for memory, responsibility, and the future, which was for forced labor victims mainly. But there was... But then medical experiments come into this um, because there was a threatened class action in the United States. Um, one of the Mengele twins uh, particularly stirred this up, Eva Moses Core. And um, there was compensation for what was called other categories of personal injury. Uh, only 8,000 euros, but given on the basis of plausibility. Um, and that's the, the final phase. So what do we see as problems? The, the, for those who survived, there was no automatic entitlement to medical care. Um, certain areas were routinely rejected, like injections and blood extraction. I think that this was not always justified even within the narrow terms. And what was certainly missing was for the effects of a concentration camp and the brutalities, with the multiple brutalities, um, on a former prisoner's health and medical condition. Never compensated. There was a German Yugoslav medical commission from 1961, would certainly be interesting to look at. The other thing about it, if, we, okay, you would be awarded, say, your 2,000 Deutschmarks, but then the Narodna Bank uh, would take maybe a third of it on exchange. So uh, the state was earning. Um, two -thirds. Two -thirds of the compensation so it was, I can say, that was, I think, a great problem of the compensation, the whole system of compensation. And you could also, the victim could die. They could place a request for compensation. They have ill health. And then, before the claim is resolved, they die and the family gets, gets, gets nothing. Um, and some of the German arguments, I think, are spurious that um, um, malaria uh, diminishes out, that may diminish slightly, but there were certainly long term consequences. Um, there's also a further issue, which is constantly the difficulty of researching it, is that there is the idea that because the victims are medical victims, they must be anonymized and that descendants' permission needs to be obtained. It's really difficult, this. I, my work works on record linkage from multiple archives. I need the identities of victims. So uh, there is the further complication of a European law on privacy. However, there is the International Holocaust Research Alliance, which has obtained an exemption in 2015 for Holocaust-related victims. Um, it's not perfect in its operation, but it, it does improve matters for the researcher. Um, so of this large number of Yugoslav victims, only 482 
at the date you can categorize or were categorized as definite experiment victims. However, there are many forms of mistreatment and brutalities for, for which should have been compensated for camp survivors. And the unfortunate thing is, is that for non-Jewish victims, the medical experiments were the only way to obtain compensation for many years. So you're forcing people to claim that they were victims of medical experiments when there was no um, definite in entitlement otherwise, um, even though you could have a very, very high levels of disability. Um, and I think that's one of the tragedies, so that those who did suffer experiments were undercompensated, and those who suffered ill treatment in compensation camps were also undercompensated and should have received um, really whatever medical treatment they needed for their injuries. And there's the open-ended commitment that on the basis of need. Now, for all, German medicine is a well-organized system of healthcare and the pharmaceuticals and so on should have been made available by on some sort of cooperative um, system of treatment. And that was never realized. So one can say that on the whole, survivors of Nazi medical experiments were never properly and duly compensated in terms of their actual needs. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for, for this. And as you said, uh, this is a kind of work in progress. And uh, but but it's really uh, uh, gives us uh, a lot of things we didn't know. Maybe the, the colleagues from the Genocide Museum know a little bit more than we are. But actually, this is the, the, the very big field for further research. Also for us, understanding how the this state was treating its uh, citizens at that time. And you also mentioned there is very interesting thing about maybe uh, uh, composition at the level of the state, that the part of the this, uh, let me say, arrangement might be this technological development or Kershko uh, power plant, atomic power plant, and that actually state was more uh, uh, focused on, let me say, general state level compensation than the compensation of the victims, which, as we saw, received very uh, uh, low uh, uh, level of compensation and money, which also was reduced due to the uh, cheating de facto by the state and so on and so on. Thank you very much. So I, I think that this will be very interesting for the colleagues as well to, to hear and to debate upon that. So please, uh, floor is your also for, for the colleagues who are at the Zoom, if we have something in the chat, I have several of the questions, but I will let the colleagues to, to start first if they have some. Uh, you have to take the mic. I mean, it, it's certainly the tragedy of the Yugoslav victims that they were given minimal compensation. So 
effectively Germany buys the legitimacy. Um, it also, um, I think that uh, from my understanding, um, Tito wanted German investment in Yugoslavia and he prioritized, and that was prioritized at the time um, rather than the, the individual victim. So the individual victim is, 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 is reduced in terms of um, the, their, claimant, their claimant rights. So, um, yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, at this point in time, there's another open issue, which is the effect on the next generation because certainly one can see a pattern of, um, say, block 10 survivors, they have children very often. Uh, okay, these were infertility experiments, but they manage to have children, but the children are very often disabled. Um, and so there is an open issue of claim of, of is there a claim for the next generation? for medical treatment and medical support for the next generation. That's certainly one issue which has been raised. Um, yeah, what does one do about the, the undercompensation by the Ministry of Finance officials? <laughs> I think they're horrible. I think they, they were really racist in their opinions. Because, for example, Mengele twins, they and until the late 1980s, they resist any compensation for. They said, "Well, a twin experiment is not a is not a medical experiment. It's just measurements." Um, so that um, which is well, we know that there were twins who were Mengele was a killer. He, many twins survived, but we know that there were twins who were killed. We know that there were twins who were had cruel operations done to them. Uh, so that um, the question is, is all, I mean, I can say as a historian, German compensation is regarded as a model. In this case, it is far from a model. It's very deeply flawed, and it was very unfair in its administration. We see that the Yugoslav state rightly took an important role in making compensation applications. So it documented what, and that's something, to, to have the, a documented claim. It pushed the claim through to the United Nations, who had a, a super, who took a supervisory role, at least at the beginning. But the, they settled for far too less. I mean, these were token amounts. They're not, it's a problem of single lump sum compensation. Globally, it seems a large amount. But once you divide it by the number of potential claimants, too little comes through. And so one has, for example, sterilization victims who say, well, I spent the money in a couple of months on hormonal preparations and um, can I have another lot of compensation and the answer comes back no it is a one-off compensation there are a few who manage to get a second amount once the Yugoslav government is administering the um, this global system from the later 1960s but it is limited what they what what what, what people get. So that uh, yeah, it's it's really a tragedy of recording what had happened. So that's good for the historical record. But in terms of actually what people needed, in terms of their existential conditions, of their injuries, and um, which were extensive, um, they are grossly undercompensated. So it's a wartime, it's a very specific form of wartime atrocity, which is not properly, um, uh, which was never prop, prop, properly handled. 
uh, Joric Zapalovic, Institute of European Studies. Uh, I came in a bit a bit late, but uh, I was wondering if you mentioned uh, uh, whether there was compensation not for experiments but for hard labor. Uh, and uh, was this considered? Because many people were in uh, concentration camps working, many dying because of hard labor, and they weren't necessarily experimented on. But so if you could elaborate on that, thank you. Okay. Uh, that was the point of this last round of compensation for memory responsibility in the future. It was 50% paid by the German state and 50% paid by, the, um, by German industry. Uh, industry. Um, and the major group for, for which compensation was meant to go to were the forced laborers. Um, I should know what the um, position was for Yugoslavia. Certainly Poland was, was, was very prominent in the whole areas. There were some groups which were completely undercompensated, which were, for example, which were Roma. Most of the Roma applications were rejected. Then the um, mentally ill who were experimented on, so from the point of view of experiments, there was an entitlement. There was never any outreach from this foundation to the mentally ill. Um, so it's a very, I think it's a very problematic situation. The target amount of 8,000 euros was, certainly not reached for the experiment victims. The, this um, cases of, um, um, uh, what are they called? Um, of persons who were subjected to um, um, brutalities. Um, it was also meant for child abduction, uh, forced abortions. Um, they were they never reached the 8,000 euro, euro amount. There should be, though, the Yugoslav documentation on this. Maybe there is someone here who knows more about it. Um, should be available, uh, both in archives here and through the and, and in German archives as well. Um, you have to negotiate with the privacy restrictions which I think are very unfortunate, <laughs> in my view, because if you're a victim, why should you be anonymized? Your injuries should be recognized. I think that's more important than the recognition than the thing, oh, you know, than this, this, this privacy issue. The privacy issue is a sort of cover-up, I think. And so um, it's a problematic situation. Just a short uh, question. You, you mentioned that uh, there were cases of hiding documents. So regarding uh, the potential candidates and the uh, documentation, are there any estimations how many cases were not registered that could have been? OK, for the medical experiments, um, I think that it's not complete, obviously. We have the difficulty that, for example, the Klauberg, Klauberg was put on trial by the Soviets. His documents will have gone to Moscow on Block 10, the sterilization victims. So we would know also not just victims who survived, but also victims who, were, who died in Birkenau. Uh, Auschwitz be for now, um, so that um, from that point of view, we do not know the full story. Also, Mengele, he had his documents at the end of the war. He left Auschwitz with his documents. He was protected by his family in the long term. The German state turned a blind eye. For many, many years to him. He could even visit Germany. He could protest against the um, the annulment of his um, medical degree um, 
by um, and so on. So that um, he he managed to get away with things. And the question is, where were his documents? Why didn't why wasn't he arrested? Why wasn't he asked? What did you do with your documents? Um, the report. Sorry, of, I'm sorry. Uh, you said that he was coming to Germany. Yeah. He visited Germany. We, we, he was being, the, in the case of Mengele, he was being bankrolled by his family. They were a big manufacturers of agricultural machinery. You still see um, tractors and trailers also with the, with the Mengele. I mean, it's no longer producing, but the firm was bankrolling him and a, or the family was bankrolling and a member of the firm was visiting him regularly, delivering cash. So if the German police would have, would have, yes it is. And it is only, they, it is only when he's died that the family then say to the police, well he's no longer alive anymore. So he died under, uh, it was a drowning accident, he, or he had a heart attack when he, while swimming. So he lived out his life. And yes, he could have been arrested. He was in Switzerland at one stage. He visited. His son was in touch with him. Um, problematic father, but um, yeah, he was definitely um, free. It's a case of uh, enormous. Um, the Israelis regarded Eichmann as a more. No, no one can understand that as more important target target than than Mengele given the choice of who to abduct. And um, he, he managed to successfully evade, um, evade arrest and trial. Um, yeah, so that um, there is an issue of under documentation of victims. I think one can get, I mean, even though a victim may not be properly compensated, at least these claims give a statement of what they are, of, of, of what they went. You have to regard the statement critically, but there is good reason for accepting what the claimant says in terms of injury, and the injuries are an objective, are objective because then there was a medical, it was a joint German Yugoslav Medical Commission. Now, it would be of great interest uh, for this research to um, to look at the documents of this joint Yugoslav German Commission, and they were meant to monitor things, to monitor the situation on the side of the victim. I've seen the uh, French Commission, for example, on which was doing that. Rather tough, actually, this French Commission to even though there was a Auschwitz survivor on the commission. Um, they 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 were they were not generous. They were quite hard on 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 victims, but they were not as hard as this um, German finance ministry. This German finance ministry is absolutely awful. And then they protest when the Red Cross awards fifty thousand euros to a victim, to fifty thousand marks. Uh, they say this is an an, an, an injustice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know it's um, it's a tragic history, I think, uh, for those who were um, either who survived or the lack of documentation on those who were killed. Um, it's um, very specific, but it caused considerable pain and long-term injury and disability with which people. Uh, they might have had to, they might have survived, but they had to live with it, and it was tough for them. Um, yeah. Well, I will use the opportunity. Actually, uh, let me spread a little bit to to some things that were connected with us then again using your presence with all other material that i mentioned i have a couple of things that that might be i think interesting for us you know first when i was studying like 30 years ago with this man 
that is sitting behind me, my professor of ethics at that time, uh, we had the course of four semesters. Those were the times before Bologna, when you were really supposed to learn some things and so on. And part of the story I remember actually when the, uh, Professor Babich was speaking about the ethical problems with uh, uh, this kind of documentation uh, with the results of the medical experiments, actually. Uh, it was the first time I, I ever came to the whole idea that somebody actually took all this experiment with radiation, with uh, many of those things. And I remember actually that you used the, exactly the idea with using the experiment with radiation, after which, of course, the, the head simply dry off or whatsoever. But actually, all this documentation ended up somehow. And the, the, there was debates about ethnic, uh, uh, ethics of using of this documentation. One argument which was saying that, of course, it's in, outrageous to you know use that for any but other people said okay that's the way we came to that is of course unacceptable but on the other hand this is existing and this can help us within the further research and so on i mean i would like to to hear you about the, the these debates even nowadays and what is really happened with these documents uh, uh, i mean at the west and at the east okay let's go one by another please Okay. Um, I mean, there was immediately the war ended. There were debates and discussions on the use of the medical data and victims and also investigators came to different positions. Uh, at one extreme, there was the idea that all this Nazi research should be burnt. That was, it was an UNRWA. British UNRWA position, and that was his opinion. And there was another position which was um, from a Polish priest who was experimented on in Auschwitz, and he's sorry, in Dachau. And um, his position was, was that if the research could be used, it should be used. There is a small amount of the research has a you could say has a utility. There was a research on phosgene, there was research on life jackets when there was the immersion of prisoners in freezing cold water in Dachau. Um, it has some utility, that research. Um, most of the research was not good quality research and could have been done better if the if they um, could have been, certainly. Um, but, okay, um, there is a debate there. Um, and the debate goes on and on and on. It's just never, <laughs> we never reach an end. And the more one acknowledges these are not pseudo-medical experiments, these were well-constructed experiments which were testing vaccines, um, which was good quality, which was viable research, producing usable results it becomes more problematic as 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 an issue yeah those two issues of the um life jackets and the safe level for this highly toxic um, um chemical chemical gas phosgene um i think those are the those are the just about, I mean, as far as I know, they're the only two areas of, 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 of research which are viable. The Mengele twin, twin research or something, or this Klauberg um, 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 infertility. Um, it certainly has, that was just racial persecution, nothing more. Uh, thank you. Uh, another one, uh, again, connected with contemporary issues about the enhancement, uh, which is especially in the last 10 years becoming a very big issue in ethics, but in military industry generally and in military debates. I know that we had uh, Professor Cocker from uh, LSE here who is leading this idea project, and he was speaking actually about the whole this, uh, uh, let me say, obsession in a way and how to, to enhance, especially for military purposes, um, uh, capacities of the soldiers uh, uh, 
for you know avoiding the panics and so on and of course the chemistry again and in a way some drugs are being used so in that sense i know that actually methamphetamine became uh, met the the famous blue met uh, that we know from uh, some recent tv shows and so on uh, came out as a, one of the experiments that uh, if i remember correct me if i'm wrong that first uh, uh, nazis used that on on uh, prisoners uh, in in different camps and then they started to use that on their uh, uh, soldiers especially in the in the the pilots and um, the submarines actually that uh, uh, so in that sense uh, uh, do you know if if those kind of experiments or medical results were used afterwards or and can we find some links with what is happening now in the in, in military let me say researches that we can compare with this kind of approach I mean, there was certainly after the second world war there was a take-up of, of research among the military um, there was um, research using war gases for example Fox, um, the, the, Sorry, I've just been speaking about um, phosgene, but there were other military gases which were used. Um, one would say, I would say, irresponsibly, uh, particularly when it would result in a soldier's death, uh, which happened on the British side. Um, surely that was not intended to so that the young military recruit should be um, should have lost his life. Um, so that um, it's a constant issue in terms of medical research, I would say, in terms of the safety of research, um, the responsibility to that uh, a researcher has uh, not to kill or maim the research subjects. Um, I mean, that's the whole point of ethical procedures. But certainly the justifications were uh, taken from Nazi medical experiments. They have a, like, a, they're like a worst case scenario in medicine because we can see that these, these were extensive and that these were initiated generally by researchers wanting to enhance their careers. They were opportunistic because they saw that they had in that the SS could provide a, um, a tame population in a concentration camp that could be readily used. We see this with, with Schilling, for example, um, who was obsessed with his research. At the end of the war, he says, oh, I'm just on the verge of a big breakthrough in malaria immunology. So he says to the Americans, well, can I continue my research? But I'll continue it on a voluntary basis. And uh, he gets a negative answer. <laughs> and he gets executed. I mean, he, he is, um, his case is brought to light at the point when the Western allies are pretty hard on any case of a death arising from a series of medical research. I mean, that's certainly in the initial cases. When the prosecutions are handed over to the German government, to the West German government, it is a series of acquittals and a series of, you might say, faking the um, the ill health of the victim. I'm sorry, the ill health of the perpetrator, and uh, to the um, to the detriment of of, of victims. Um, one can see this in yeah, it, both in Austria and in Germany. You might have um, someone like Heinrich Gross, who was involved in the killing of several hundred children in the Spiegelgrund, their brains were preserved in an institute. There are actually some, I, there are some Croatian victims of Gross whose brains were preserved um, for this Institute for Brain Research. 
And yeah, Gross is never successfully prosecuted. Um, now the, um, the Spiegelgrund clinic is regarded as a, a, a major atrocity. The victims were identified in person by name. Um, there's some very good, there's one very, the sister of a victim uses clinical files of the children to reconstruct their life history. I think she does it extremely well. Um, the West German, the Germans say, no, you cannot use a clinical file. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's wrong. Um, I think you need to go beyond the, you need to, <coughs> the problematic diagnosis and how the person was living with their diagnosis, I think needs to be brought into account. And you have the other absurdity with, with consent, that this gross will write to parents, can I have permission to carry out a series of medical tests? Okay, the parents, he gets permission and then a few weeks later, he says, oh, unfortunately, your child has died. Well, he killed the child. And so he gets consent, but he, <laughs> but he doesn't get consent to kill. But it was part of the killing procedures. So it's... So, and this problematic history of saying that you can only name a victim of this sort of research psychiatry continues in Germany. If you visit at the Philharmonie in Berlin, there's a memorial to T4. Yeah, there are accounts from German victims from their families. They're acknowledged by name because the family has been asked to give permission. They get consent. And then you have other blacked out victims. Well, they're the Jewish victims who are blacked out because there is no family to give consent. And so they remain um, a blacked out name on them. I, I don't think it's right. I think this German position of it's an abuse of consent if you ask me, because they want consent. Yeah, it's a courtesy to consult with the family. I absolutely agree. I'm in favor of that. But still there is a, as a historian, I believe in a victim-oriented research. And I think providing that one is sensitive to the victims, one is not, um, I, can say, I think it is in the victim's interest to say how they died, and it is in the victim's interest to give their name. Of course, it's a presumption that I make, but I would say that uh, history is a form of accountability, and it's accountability for all sorts of atrocities and for all sorts of things that go wrong. Also, political accountability as well. You know, you're 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 it's a, and uh, you're reconstructing what went on, and then you can deliver a judgment on what went on. That's uh, the role of a of a historian, and I think it can be done responsibly. I would like to think that I'm not instrumentalizing the victims, but I would like to to name the victims and to and I think there are very good examples of biographical reconstruction and. I think this blacking out or digital removal of names or all sorts of things that done, I think it's appalling and that still goes on in Germany and I can debate with my colleagues um, and I think they're a real problem, they're fanatical about it because effectively what they're doing is they are re-medicalizing the victims by saying well you need consent to name and we need to, we have a case for example of um, this is in this brain research. We have the brain specimen. So I suggested that you can analyze the victim, a chunk of the brain, to see whether poison, to see whether the victim was poisoned. So it's a forensic test. Oh, they're endlessly complicated. They need to, tr the Germans say, yes, but we need to trace the family and provide two different branches of the family, and they need to give permission. We can't do it unless we have a formal permission. 
Well, I would say I think as a commission appointed, it would be responsible to do this work. And to one, my last, and Professor Babich has uh, uh, just briefly uh, did Anne and Erbe had any connections with these kind of experiments, or what happened with their interest for medical or whatsoever? Yeah, absolutely. The Anne and Erbe did. The Anne and Erbe were very much involved, for example, in the um, the medical faculty in Strasbourg the Reich Medical Faculty, the French University evacuated. So the if you want, if you were a professor of anatomy and you wanted to have, if you wanted to develop your Jewish skeleton collection, you went to the Arn and Erbe to get a batch of Jews from Auschwitz. And, uh, or another case, and then when one virologist, sees his colleague, oh wow, he's getting all these experimental research subjects and he's getting their bodies. So he wants a batch of, he wants to test this new um, um, typhus vaccine, um, someone called Eugen Hagen. So he gets a batch of 100 gypsies and they're not good enough quality. Uh, so he wants some gypsies who were kicked out of the German army um, to for, for his experiments, and a lot of these gypsies die being transported to and from Auschwitz. Um, so that um, these are cases where the Anenerbe of the SS, it's an SS research organization, will definitely have a role in providing the research subjects. What I do not see is a link between any of these Nazi research organizations and Mengele. I think Mengele's research was improvised in Auschwitz. He was given a twin block for, I think, 700 twins, roughly. Um, that would be 350 pairs of twins. Um, because he's so dutiful on the ramp in selecting Jews for the gas chamber. He's meticulous in this racial killings, so that he then Mengele is able to build up this research, which involves many, many prisoners of prisoner researchers. And of course, he has to feed his twins and so on. So that's his reward for um, so that um, and the, here we have and why Mengele was overlooked for so for the initial couple of years until Auschwitz prisoners said, oh, Mengele, you need to capture him, um, is because um, there was no direct link to the SS for the twin block. Otherwise, there would have been a much more rapid re response to Mengele. But certainly the uh, other organizations and the Arnenero was able to lever research funds for, from the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, the German research fund and so on. So there was money for this type of, you could call it experimental torture or or victim or victim research but certainly yeah and there is a lot of new research has come out on the Arnenerbe and its responsibility for, for, for experiments, partly for, from this um, Strasbourg Commission, which was commissioned by the University of Strasbourg, finally taking responsibility. The French University has to take responsibility for the German University. That was a big thing. That only happened in um, around 2015 that they finally were able to do that. Um, but certainly, the t yeah, the, it's partly an issue of responsibility and it's partly an issue of what research was conducted. And yeah, the Ananava was a major there in that. But, but a controversy and not all the, what's been published, I would say is reliable. Yeah. Uh, uh, really. Um, uh, it's a hotbed of controversy. Um, I could talk about that if you would want, but um, I think maybe I've talked a lot. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a point in something, something different than I might have. But before, uh, before doing that, I, I would like to uh, give a very short comment regarding the informed consent. To me, it's always looked like a very fraught instrument. That's because in light and very cardinal issues of life, uh, consent, informed consent seems to be not enough. If it's uh, uh, dealing with your life, it's not uh, proper to consent to something. You, can, you should ask, require. Uh, that's, uh, and that, that's the comment. Uh, on the day, on Saturday, actually, three days ago, I was in Prebilovci, that's a very obscure place in Western Herzegovina, where some of most sinister uh, events in, I think, in the whole World War II uh, happened. Uh, but what those Ustashas were doing there was not experimenting at all. What's characteristic, however, is that uh, they were not trying to amend or perfect the torture or the methods that they use. They just employed what they think to be the most, uh, the previously most suffering and most uh, humiliation. So we are talking here on experiments. Uh, and my question, no, I, okay. I have a question. Uh, I suppose there were many experiments that were not scientific in the sense that they uh, have a purpose to uh, in health issues. But uh, the purpose of which was to uh, perfect the torch uh, as such. Okay. Are there some uh, some uh, debate about that kind of experiment? Okay. Uh, I can think of you have the testing of forms of killing. So, for example, the use of zyklon gas versus the use of carbon monoxide gas. <laughs> that was one of torture. You have a Nazi psychiatrist who was using electrocution to kill, and he was perfecting his system of electrocution, which he did in a particular uh, a psychiatric hospital and killing uh, large numbers of patients. And this so, kind of some kind of... Did he want to torture the patient? I think in this case, he wanted to kill the maximum number as quickly as possible. Um, do you get a full scale, yeah, causing pain? And the um, that's harder to. Uh, there, I can't think of an example. I think I, I can think of efficient forms of killing. Certainly, I mean that's within the context of um, the Holocaust, genocide. Um, but um, and certainly there are plenty of. <laughs> medically qualified people who were involved in in forms of killing or selections on the on, on the on the ramp in uh, as in auschwitz or in so there's a definite application of medical knowledge to kill i would have thought they you think that you think that pain was an important that they wanted to induce sheer pain to I, 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 I mean, case is there was a in Ivan uh, no on the uh, the original Mandarina, the case where a uh, person was awarded with some amount of money if the victim would survive for example, two days after being, I don't know how to say that in English, not in a call uh, In pain. Yeah. So uh, to produce uh, more painful and more humiliating that, or more suffering and more humiliation, is a kind of technique. Uh, and uh, to know how to uh, produce a better torture, for example, for the purpose of better torturing in the future for whichever 
purposes might be, and some of those purposes are allegedly justified. It's very <laughs> suspicious. Uh, you may use experiments to make torture more torturing, not just more efficient in finishing, but in torturing as such. To, to break the will of the victim, for example, you, you have to torture it. So uh, it's, uh, it's something that is a proper subject of experiment experimentation, which is not just employed what you think it's uh, uh, what you have at your disposal at the moment, but uh, you might be uh, curious how to perfect the torch. Okay, I think that's quite special. I can see that there were experiments with truth drugs. Um, sorry. Sorry. Uh, um, I can see that there were experiments with, for example, with truth drugs, with mescaline, for example. That's certainly the case. Um, mescaline in Dachau. I, it's really special to provide the victim's account, of, but I can immediately identify identify that. Um, the, uh, I can see that there are experiments for efficient killing. That I think goes on, but efficiently to produce maximum pain. Wow, because pain would be regarded as disruptive in terms of an efficient killing procedure unless you were uh, wanted to extract either you want to extract some information uh, the, 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 we spoke about that actually yeah. this difference between nazi camps and ustasha's way of you know killing people which was totally different you know they were enjoying in let me say giving the pain and this kind of stuff while nazis were very efficient in many ways trying to uh, uh treat that as an industry and not interested in pain as it is i think okay i mean i think that the <laughs> There's the way an ex the way research is planned and the way it's implemented, and the way it's implemented will often with the Nazis involve gratuitous pain, because that's what concentration camp guards like doing. They didn't design the experiment, but for example, the shoe track in Sachsenhausen, where the, the um, prisoners were testing shoe leather and so on, there was a scientific design, there was an economic utility to this work, but the guards wanted to inflict extra pain by making, by putting shoes on that didn't fit and so on, so that being forced around this trap, so that the, or the way that the, the Roma were treated when they were transported to Strasbourg on, in cattle trucks and chained up for, eight, I think they took eight days, which is, much longer than the normal train train should have taken, and so that many many were killed and uh, suffered for this. So that the uh, I think there are two aspects with the implementation of the experiments. One is is that there is resistance, sabotage. I think that has to be figured in. And the other side is the infliction of pain, where it's not actually necessary from the perpetrator side. So there are two sides which add into the, which make the history more complicated. And the crucial word there are needed yeah. for at least two cases. Yeah, yeah. There are at least two cases where that not necessary momentum might be present in case of revenge you want to make as much pain. And not only pain, the humiliation. The humiliation is even more important in such cases, especially in revenge. And the other uh, type is uh, uh, with sadists who are not satisfied with small pain and small humiliation. So they might experiment how to, uh, to be more satisfied by exploring the possibilities, as it were. Yeah. I fully accept. Yeah. 
is Peter Minutinovic. I come from the Institute of Indian Studies as a and um, I'll just like to add something regarding the compensation rates for Yugoslav victims. When I say Yugoslav victims, I mean mostly Serbs, Jews and Roma. Um, as you mentioned uh, in the very beginning, um, there were no medical exper uh, experiments taking place in the concentration camps on the territory of Yugoslavia. The uh, uh, most renowned are Jastinovac, Saimiste and Gospic. Uh, therefore, it seems to me that um, it is quite um, uh, justifiable that the compensation rates are then enormously lower for Yugoslav victims uh, than for the victims, uh, than for Hungarians or Polish victims, um, since uh, uh, they were, of course, uh, uh, as well as Jews, of course, uh, mainly, uh, most notably, um, the victims of medical experiences. Of course, um, uh, this is just a comment, but, uh, but um, uh, there are of course, Yugoslav victims that were sent to uh, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, uh, even Sachsenhausen. I was actually there uh, four years ago, where you can even see uh, the blood trail uh, even today. So, um, my uh, my comment is actually that uh, Yugoslavs were uh, actually compensated for uh, hard labor and hard work in these concentration camps uh, rather than for medical experience uh, experiments. So, um, uh, in, in that sense, I would just like to add add to to the debate. The problem is, is that forced labour was not compensated until this much later um, phase with this, um, well, it came in 1998 with the compensation of, of forced labour. So that um, the, <laughs> the difficulty was you were a victim of forced labour. It could be sometimes very... Uh, you would be held under, I mean, the forced labor really was, it, 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 you could find better conditions. It could be advantageous to be transferred out of Auschwitz into some factory, but it could also be appalling. Um, it was a, but still, it was only later that there was a, comp that there was compensation available. And then the amount that was made available was a pathetic amount. It seems a lot when you aggregate it, but it's always the problem of single lump sum uh, compensation. So, and that's problem you find that with other, I can say, medical um, um, catastrophes. For example, there's a drug called thalidomide or contragan, and um, those sufferers seems that they were paid, they, were, they agreed to what was a completely inadequate settlement. And so later in life, the, um, the victims actually require more, um, more financial support just to get them through daily life because the amount is just far, far too low, um, which the, um, particularly for the German uh, sufferers from this, um, it was a, to do, doing, was to do with the managing of pregnancy, which the firm got away with an irresponsibly lower amount that they had to pay. Had to, that they had to pay. But yeah, there's a post-1945 history, but I don't, I think it's, um, I won't say it, with just, you. I think it's the way you are looking at it, I think doesn't, doesn't encapsulate fully what people went through and what people should, should have, ideally should have been compensated for. They were not, I think, well represented by the, um, by the Yugoslav state, sadly. I didn't keep talking. 
Yes. Not on an experimental basis, you know, as, <laughs> as you said. Uh, uh, Professor, thank you very much. You know, we, uh, uh, unfortunately, generally in our uh, society, academical community and institution, there is not a lot of knowledge of those things, unfortunately. And for that, it's really important to, to, to get everything with which we go today and to understand the broader consequences and what our colleagues also imply today the possibilities how to approach to that and to people who are still alive or uh, as you mentioned the, the, the fate of the children of those people who were medically uh, treated and so on. So I think that this might initiate an interest among some of our young colleagues here or other institute, institutions to continue to work on those issues and we really learned quite a lot today. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.